Each week I've said that turning points are those situations in our lives we're usually not aware uh, when they occur. We, we don't know that it's a turning point, but, but some new person perhaps comes into our life and everything starts to change. It could be some decision that we make, and again, the trajectory of our life starts to change. could be some event, something that just comes from the outside that hits us and our life starts to change, and, and it could be an experience. Some people have a certain experience, and it starts to color the rest of their life turning points now the the purpose of this series is that we can become more acclimated more aware that God is active in our lives he's active in our lives when we know it when we feel it and when we don't know it and when we don't feel it but the more we become aware of what these turning points look like we might be able to recognize them when they come we might be able to navigate them better we might be able to help others do the same so to get us started this morning I'm going to actually ask you three questions, but I'm going to start with two questions. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I want you to just let this at least sink in. Answer it for yourself. Has there been a time in your life, if you were to be very honest, there certainly was in mine, where all things considered, I didn't really want God to exist. I, I lived my life doing my thing my way. I didn't want God to be involved in my life at all. Have you ever had a time in your life like that? Question two. Have you ever had an experience in life where, frankly, you were desperate? You might have been desperate mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally, economically, but, man, you were broken down. You were helpless. You were on the ropes. You were hanging by a thread. You were desperate. Have you ever had a time like that? Tuck those two questions away. They'll be valuable later. Was there ever a time when pretty much you lived as though God didn't exist? You didn't want him to be a part of your life? Was there ever a time where you were, you were desperate? Now, to get us on the trail of today, how many of you have ever played stealth like in a grocery store? You know what I'm talking about? Or Walmart? Stealth? You know what I'm saying? So here, here's what stealth is about. So like you, you see somebody that you don't want to see you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> there could be a lot of reasons for it, a lot of reasons. But let's just say in this particular game of stealth you play, you're playing stealth because this is a person that at another time in life, maybe a lot of years ago, they did great damage to you. They did great hurt to you. They, they really wronged you in some way. And so now you see them and you're like, oh man, I, I don't even want to do this. But then you go down the aisle and you're looking for some ketchup and you know what happens, right? <laughs> You're confronted with them. Eye to eye. It's, it's just not what you wanted at all. You pause for a minute. You assess things. Your, your mind is racing. And, and then you realize they're looking at you, but they don't know who you are. They don't appear to remember you at all. Now you have a decision to make. Because you know that this, this relational conflict was never resolved sufficiently. You know that there were words that needed to be spoken. You know there were things that needed to be done. And, and now you're speeding through this process in your mind, and you're wondering, what, what do I do? Do I reveal myself to them since I don't have to? They're, they're clearly not even, they don't even remember me, but boy, do I remember them. Or do you hit the pause and just say, no way, no how? Now, I want to start this message by saying this, because the title of the message is this. This has to be resolved. The situation I just gave you does not necessarily have to be resolved. So I want to say from the start, there are some relational rifts, conflicts, separations, whatever term you want to use, that you and I go through that in this life... They're never going to be resolved. They're never going to be reconciled. In fact, I'll go as far as to say they, they shouldn't even be. We shouldn't even attempt to in many cases. They have to be just let go. Now, there are many that can be reconciled and should be reconciled, but not every. So I, I want to just get that out of some of your minds right now because some of you have had some relational rifts that maybe still haunt you, still bother you, you were severely hurt by them, whatever it might be, and you're thinking, oh man, this God saying, I got to go back to that situation and do this, do that, and resolve it somehow. I'm not saying that. That's not what this message is about. But what I am saying is this, 
this has to be resolved. There are some relational rifts that have to be resolved. Not everyone. Okay, that's as much I can say, but I've got a lot, a lot of information to cover today. Last week, I introduced to you, how many, just curious, how many were here last week? So I know how many will be with me. Okay, so a lot of you at least, most of you perhaps, uh, I introduced a young man named Joseph in, from Genesis chapter 37. And Joseph was uh, a member of a family in which he had 10 brothers. There would be an 11th that comes along. And God gives him a dream. In fact, God gives him two dreams. And in these dreams, Joseph is depicted as ruling over all of his older brothers as well as his mom and dad. And the older brothers who were already very jealous of Joseph because he had a doting father. Joseph was his father's favorite. The brothers hate Joseph. They first intend to kill him, but then they actually take him as a 17-year-old kid and they sell him into slavery. And these Ishmaelite slave traders come and they take him down into Egypt and that's kind of where we left the story off. Now I've got to fill in some blanks before we go to the text. So he is sold into slavery in Egypt. He goes into the, the captain of Pharaoh's guard, a guy named Potiphar. God starts blessing Potiphar's house profusely because the hand of God was on Joseph, on his life, with him. Potiphar turns the whole run of the household over to Joseph, this 17-year-old kid. Potiphar's wife constantly harasses Joseph sexually and he, he resists, he rejects her every time finally she literally physically grabs him one time he has to run out of his cloak to get away from her she's of course humiliated and so when her husband Potiphar gets home she tells Potiphar, her husband hey this Hebrew slave you brought in here he tried to rape me and of course Joseph did not and off he goes to prison now he's languishing in prison but the scripture says you read these on your own in Genesis 39 Genesis, I'm kind of filling in gaps between Genesis 39 and 42 we're going to pick up in a bit uh, it says the hand of the Lord was with him in prison and he's, God's blessing him there and all of a sudden the prison the head of the prison kind of turns the run of things he's kind of like a trustee over to Joseph and Joseph just keeps rising to the top while he's in prison Pharaoh gets angry at his cupbearer the cupbearer in ancient days was like you know when the king's food was brought out or his wine was brought out you as the cupbearer got to taste the food first or the wine first because people wanted to kill the kings and so if it was poisonous you died and the king lives so the cupbearer was both a good job you ate the best food and the worst job if somebody's trying to assassinate the king anyway Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker get on his bad side and Pharaoh sends them to jail they're in jail they meet Joseph they have a troubling dream while they're in jail the spirit of God gives Joseph an interpretation to their dreams and he tells the baker he says bad news for you my man you're going to be executed good news for you cupbearer you're going to be restored and sure enough just like Joseph had said the cupbearer is restored he goes back to Pharaoh the last thing Joseph says to the cupbearer he says man when you go back remember me and he says of course but he doesn't and a couple more years go by and Joseph is just languishing in prison all of a sudden something happens the Pharaoh has a dream he knows it's not a normal dream he has the dream and it's a twofold dream and essentially what it was showing is this is there was going to be a seven year period of famine in Egypt that was going to be preceded by a seven year period of bountiful harvest now Pharaoh didn't know what it meant he tries to get all of his astrologers and so forth to give him an interpretation nobody can give the interpretation and then the cupbearer conveniently remembers oh I met this guy in prison when you were angry at me that time and his God gives the interpretation of dreams Pharaoh brings Joseph in Joseph then gives the interpretation that I just gave you there's going to be seven years of bountiful harvest but then there's going to be seven years of severe famine and Pharaoh is just knocked out with Joseph he's like there's nobody like you the spirit of God is in you there's nobody with the kind of wisdom as you other than myself you are the man your word is law in Egypt now we'll pick up the story here we go Joseph was how old he started his journey when he was 17 that's 13 years let, let that sink in and get personal for a minute 13 years after God had given him a dream a sense of calling a sense of mission 
13 years of living in less than ideal conditions for an indefinite period of time. He never knew when it was going to end. Some of you are living in less than ideal conditions right now, and you don't know if there's a stop point or not, and that is very hard to deal with as a human being. Joseph is a model for us. We've got to clutch God. We've got to draw near to him. We have to trust him at those times, and we have to do something that I personally hate to do. Perhaps you understand it with me. Wait. I don't like to wait. Most of us don't like to wait. So 13 years, this young man who did nothing to deserve it, let that sink in. God allowed him to suffer the way he did. For 13 years, he did nothing to deserve it. But once you think about something, what better preparation for leadership of the most prominent nation in the world than to go through what Joseph went through? Joseph knows what it means to be rejected. He knows what it means to be treated unjustly. He knows what it means to be humiliated. He knows what it means to be deprived of freedom. He he understands all these things. It's been burnt into his character. So now when power is given to him, he has the character to sustain it. So here we go. Joseph was 30 years old, 13 years in between, when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph was the governor that's probably better translated prime minister it was a very high position only pharaoh was above him joseph was the governor of the land the person who sold grain to the people remember there were seven years of bountiful harvest uh joseph told pharaoh he says we need to store up for seven years to prepare for the seven years of um, famine that's going to come he sold grain to all the people so when joseph's who brothers arrived they did what remember the dream joseph is a 17 year old kid god gives him the dream two times in which his brothers are bowing down to him the brothers are enraged are you going to rule over us are you going to reign over us you have to understand what they did they projected they projected their own thoughts of what power is for onto joseph joseph wasn't even thinking anything he's just thinking god gave me this dream i don't know what it means But they were thinking, we know what we would do if we were ruling and reigning. We would arbitrarily command people to serve us, make our life more comfortable, make our life easier. We would certainly not be thinking about how to serve them. They would serve us. We would control. We would coerce. And so they projected this on Joseph, and they they hate him. And Joseph's not even thinking of this. So now, when you come to this verse, when it says, so when Joseph's brothers arrived, let me give you a little more context Okay, 13 years, Joseph is in this hellish existence. Then he becomes the prime minister of Pharaoh. The seven years of abundant harvest have taken place. And now there's been two years of drought. So if you do the math, you've got 13 plus 7. Somebody work with me? 13 plus 7 is what? Yes, thank you. (laughs) Not everybody's good at math, I understand. (laughs) And then if you add two more years to that, 22. Here's my point. It's been 22 years since these brothers have seen Joseph. And now Joseph is very Egyptian looking, meaning he's got all the hair on his body, all shaved off on his head and everywhere. And he's got the makeup on his eyes and probably a prominent, you know, headpiece. And they see Joseph, but he's playing stealth with them. If you read the chapters, chapter 40, 41, 42, he, he, he tests these guys out. He doesn't let them know that he knows them, but they don't know him. They don't recognize him. And now they are in desperate need. They're, they're starving, literally starving to death. Their children are starving to death. The whole family's going to die. The famine is so bad. So they're forced to go down to Egypt. Joseph knows them, but they don't recognize him. But they do what the dream that Joseph had had 22 years earlier showed in the dream. Now, when that dream came, Joseph didn't know what it meant. The brothers didn't know what it meant. They put a terrible interpretation on it. But Joseph is not one that's enjoying ruling over them. It's the circumstances that brought this about. By the way, I I want to throw something in. When this title of this message, this has to be resolved... When, when I started with that, you have to understand, neither Joseph or the brothers had any, any emotion whatsoever. They, it, probably not even a thought about healing this relationship, this broken relationship. I'm going to repeat that again. 
22 years went by. There's no indication that Joseph thought about, man, I got to get together with my brothers. We, we got to resolve this. There's no indication that the brothers expected to ever see Joseph again or perhaps ever gave him a thought. I'm trying to get across a point to you. God initiated this reconciliation. He does not initiate every reconciliation. Some reconciliations don't happen in this life and, and perhaps should not happen in this life. In fact, certainly should not happen in this life. But anyway, this was divinely initiated. Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who had the grain, sold the grain to the people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him, their faces to the ground. It goes on. Now I've jumped a couple chapters. When Joseph, now this is, this is let me give you some in-between. The brothers get the food, they go back, they take it, then they run out of food, they have to come back again. And so this is the second time now Joseph has been around them, but he hasn't revealed himself to them. But his heart's breaking. Earlier it says that when he was with them, he had to run out of the room because he was crying. He was so moved with emotion to see him. They hated him, but he never hated them. He loved his brothers all along. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and the Pharaoh's household heard about it Joseph said to his brothers I'm Joseph is my father still living but his brothers were not able to answer him because they were what terrified at his presence so now he's told them who he is he doesn't look anything like he did when he was a kid he's all Egyptian looking and these guys are terrified why because of their own guilty conscience because of what they knew they wanted to do to this kid they wanted to kill him but instead they just sold him into slavery and they had kind of evidently washed their hands as best they could but when you read the conversations they they talked in joseph's presence not knowing that he understood what they were saying about god must be punishing us because of what we did to the poor young kid, Joseph. So, so Joseph knew this was on their minds, but they were terrified because of their own guilt. When you and I have not sufficiently, with God's grace, res resolved our guilt, our shame, then fear will be the result, and, and we'll live a, a life of foreboding, always expecting the worst to happen. Because they were terrified of his presence, then Joseph said to his brothers, come, what does it say? Come close to me. Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Now, he doesn't let them off the hook. He says, you, you, you did. You sold me into Egypt. Goes on. But look at what he says next. And now, do not be distressed and do not be what? Angry with yourselves. That's what happens when guilt and shame are not resolved with, with God's grace we get angry at ourselves and we often get depressed and we often uh, become vulnerable to mood altering experiences and substances and the whole course of our life can can take on a negative connotation don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here he's not let, letting them off the hook because it was to save lives that god sent me ahead of you now this is where joseph he just kind of transcends he says okay you you guys you know you did what you did but what you didn't see is that dream that God gave me God's dream wasn't about me ruling over you it wasn't about me exerting power over you it was about me being positioned so that I could rescue you and he says he and it goes on to say and he kissed all his brothers and what did he do he wept over them afterward after the kiss, after the weeping, his brothers now, we can talk to him. He's not angry. He's not going to take vengeance. We deserve vengeance, but it's not in the kid. He's, he's different. Joseph in Scripture has been recognized for hundreds of years as a type of Christ. Joseph was sold into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold out by the Jewish nation for 30 pieces of silver, personalized in Judas. And Joseph's character is just absolutely remarkable. Now, let's get, let's get on the, the personal side of this. So, so now we got the storyline, this beautiful storyline, but, 
But what does that say or what would God want to say through this story to you and I today? And here we go. This has to be resolved. That relationship had to be resolved. This relationship, that had to be resolved so that we might be rescued. God wanted that relationship to be reconciled because it was the only way he could save the brothers, the family, who become the nation of Israel. Now, now God was taking initiative and that's why i said earlier you know it was god taking initiative joseph wasn't the brothers weren't they weren't even apparently thinking about it but god knew these individuals these brothers 12 of them benjamin is is the younger brother that's added they are going to be the kind of the city states of the nation that i the living god am going to form i'm going to reveal myself to a certain body of people a nation and then when they take my word and accumulate it and protect it and preserve it and pass it on I'm going to reveal myself to this nation and then through this nation through the Bible to the rest of the world and through this nation I will ultimately come in in person take on physical flesh live out my life before their eyes go to a cross to show that I have nothing but sacrificial love for them and ultimately, it all depended upon the, these brothers, this family. This family, this had to be resolved. This wasn't just a normal relational rift. This was a critical navigational point, a strategic point in, in God's attempt to reach and rescue all of humanity, all of mankind. So this particular relationship, it had to be resolved. And this has to be resolved so that we might be rescued. Let's apply it now to us there's a rift the bible says between humanity mankind and our creator we don't like the thought of his rule perhaps most of us as i you know suggested in the question earlier perhaps most of us have had times where and and let me let me spread this a little water maybe right now maybe right now we have areas in our life where we know our god our king our creator our sustainer the lover of our soul that he wants us to take a certain sector of our life and handle it a certain way but we say i don't don't, i'm not doing that I'm, i'm my own man i'm my own woman i i'm an adult i'm not i'm not listening to that and so perhaps right now we are in controversy with God who wants our best, wants to rescue us, but we see his rescue as nothing more than an arbitrary attempt to rule over us, to control us, to coerce us, to live in ways that we find uncomfortable. Are you uncomfortable in some area of your life where God's word has been very clear that he lovingly wants us to change he wants to rescue us from something but we just think it's arbitrary it's like man everybody's doing it i'm not going to do this i'm not going to be controlled by some antiquated book and some supposed god even though i may believe in his existence i'm I'm not going to take this too seriously man i hope i'm not talking to you but i know that i am talking to some of you i know that i interact with enough people to know that pete when he was talking earlier you know about the song he says you know when jesus talked about the rock he was saying the ones whose feet are on the rock who are building their lives on the rock are not those that hear the word of god read jesus own words in matthew chapter 7 verse 21 through 23 he says it's not hearing the word it's not knowing the word it's not being able to quote the word even he says the ones that are building their life on the rock are those that are actually putting it into practice and perhaps there's an area in your life where God wants to rescue you but he can't you're going to have to learn the hard way I've had to learn some things the hard way I'm a hard headed person by nature and I have not been an easy child for God to father and perhaps you're the same so this has a very personal application for each of us God these these brothers just saw this arbitrary rule just telling they envisioned Joseph just telling them what to do commanding them around they're like no way no how and sometimes we think that God's word just arbitrarily tells us to do things but we don't have to take it serious nobody takes that stuff serious these days and we do that to our own demise 
In the book of 2 Peter, it says this. It says that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some misunderstand slowness or some, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, with me, with us, not wanting anyone to what? Perish, but everyone that's me that's you that's the pope that's everyone but everyone to come to what repentance. now what does repentance mean kind of a churchy word churchy new testament is written in greek the word the word in greek there it's metanoia it, it literally means i'm moving in one direction and i stop and i turn around and i go in a different direction it also means I change my mind about things. In this particular case, it's saying God can't rescue me unless I change my mind about the way I'm going to live my life. If I'm going to insist on living my life with supreme trust in me, in myself, I'm going to do it my way, or at least I'm going to do a lot of things my way. I am not going to put supreme trust in God. Then he can't rescue me. He may want. You ever see those things, those flood scenes? I love them. The people, you know, they shouldn't have drove in that water. How many of you? You're the guy. You would drive, drive in the water. Next thing you know, your car is floating. But it, but it always cracks me up. So the people are on top of the roof of the car, you know, and so finally they're dropping down a, a something from a helicopter, and the people are, you know, they're, like, they're fighting the thing away. They, they, you know, God's trying to rescue us sometimes. Man, I don't want to hear that. I like what I'm doing. I'm going, to, I'm going to do this no matter what. I'm going to take my chances. And we have to learn things the hard way. So, so God's not willing that anybody should perish. This tells us that God has given to human beings free will. We're made in his image. We're made in his likeness. And we have the freedom to resist and reject God's good will for us. And we can do that throughout this whole life this life is a sifting process God is calling together a family an eternal family of angels and humans that trust in him love him love righteousness love his goodness and we will be transformed to Christ likeness and dwell forever in a world where God's will is done by everyone all the time and because of that it will be a beautiful heavenly existence first timothy kind of reiterates the same thing he says god our savior talking about jesus he noticed he's called god he wants all people to be what to be saved he wants everybody to be saved but not everybody's going to be saved jesus himself said that because we have free will and we can reject and resist god's truth and to come to the knowledge of the truth there is a thing called truth it is revealed by god who is the source of all truth it doesn't matter if we like it or not we can choose not to believe in gravity but you jump off a high enough mountain gravity will believe in you <laughs> galatians 1 says this who gave and it's talking about jesus who gave himself for our sins why to you tell me rescue us from what this present evil age according to the will of our god and father what does it mean to be rescued from this evil age? He's not going to sweep us away and take us out of this world. We know that. So it's saying that he's going to somehow influence our minds so that we see what we didn't see before, what was deceiving us and manipulating us and seducing us. We, we see it for what it is, and we say, no way, no how. We, we see the reality that as human beings, we are needy creatures dependent upon our Creator. We were always meant to live in a dependent union with Christ our Creator. Let me just ask you a few questions. Is there anyone in this room that can say for sure that in the next week, please, I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean spirit or more, but bring it down. But I'm just, we, we need a moment of honesty occasionally. Is there anybody in this room, I don't care how young you are, I don't care how powerful you are, I don't care how intelligent you are, I don't care how much money you have. Is there anybody in this room that can say in the next week for sure you will not be a victim of a deadly car accident? No. You can't say that. Or can anybody in this room say for sure you won't get the bad doctor report within a week? You may think you can say that, but you can't. Is there anybody in this room that can say for sure that a war, a massive war, will not invade your, my, our peace and perhaps end our existence as we know it? No, you can't say that. So, so 
we need to be rescued from this evil age. Let, let me take this in one other direction. How many in this room know for sure that if I could blink my eyes and everybody in the whole world forevermore would always tell the truth all the time, you tell me, would the world be better or worse? Would it be better? Yeah, okay. If I could blink my eyes and everybody in the world, you're not going to like this one, would cease from everything that God calls sexual immorality. Would the world be a better place? You tell me. Would it? Yes. Oh, you know it would. If, if, if I could blink my eyes, you blink your eyes, and all of a sudden, you're not going to like this one either. Some of you especially, you're going to say, why are you picking on me, man? <laughs> <laughs> all profanity would be ended. Would the world be better? Oh, yes, it would. Well, if I could blink my eyes, and, and all outbursts of anger, would it be better? Yes, so I could just go on and on, and you know it, we need to be, re this evil age, it's not normal, and our God wants to show us what normalcy is. It, it's a world where his will is done by everyone. God invites us to experience his own life, the kind of life that he lives, and he can't give it to us unless we will embrace living the way he himself lives and learning to love the way he himself loves he wants to rescue us and i need a rescue and you need a rescue and our world needs a rescue don't ever kid yourself we need a rescue all all you need is one 24-hour period and you'll see just how vulnerable just how dependent you and i are we need a rescue from this present evil age now there's a second component to this this has to be resolved we're talking about joseph and we're talking about ourselves this has to be resolved so that god might be revealed it is in the rescue of the brothers that Joseph is revealed. Joseph reveals himself to the brothers and the, the revelation of the meaning of the dream, the God-given dream 22 years earlier, it's all revealed, but it's revealed that, that he's not sent out to rule and reign and command and coerce and arbitrarily push his will on the will of the brothers. No, God was positioning Joseph to rescue his brothers. And it was in the rescuing of the brothers that Joseph is revealed and that's very important for you and I listen to what the scripture says in the New Testament about Jesus it says for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body what that is saying is that everything that you and I will ever be able to understand everything that any angel will ever be able to understand it's all now been revealed in the humanity of Jesus God this is a, this is a killer God loves people don't get me wrong he loves angels but he really 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 on a different level loves humankind so much so that he became human so much so that he revealed himself fully and could not reveal himself until he became human then he could really show to the angelic civilizations as well as to humanity who he really was and how he really thought and how he really felt by becoming smaller as it were becoming human he became greater he could reveal the greatness and the kindness and the goodness of his heart it wasn't until joseph revealed himself to his brothers that they saw that they had completely misinterpreted not only the god-given dream but the heart of joseph he didn't want to rule over them and he didn't want to take vengeance on them he was not angry with them. They thought for sure he'd be angry. He was not bitter at them. They thought for sure he'd be bitter. No, no, no. He, he just was thrilled that God had positioned him that he could rescue them and bless them. And he weeps on them and he kisses them. Colossians 1 goes on to say this. It says, and through him, meaning Christ, to reconcile. Reconcile, that's a broken relationship that is going to be put back together before Satan slandered the character of God to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve trusted God completely. And now God wants to win back our trust. And he, he's setting out to win back that trust by revealing himself fully, which he has now completely accomplished in Christ, particularly on the cross. And that's what this passage is going to talk about. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It's like, I don't get that, Randy. What, what's that? How's he making peace by his blood shed on the cross well instead of being 
angry at us for neglecting him, not wanting him to really be in our lives at times, for messing up the bodies he's given us, for messing up the minds he's given us, for messing up the world that he's given us. He's not angry at us. In fact, he loves us. Joseph's brothers expected him to be angry. They were terrified in his presence. Anybody that we're afraid of, we're never going to trust and love. I'm going to just tell you that. It's never going to be deep. God wants, actually wants us to love him. It says in 1 John 4, 18, it says, God's perfect love is meant to cast out our fear. Until all fear of God is gone, we're not going to be able to love him the way that he authentically waits, that we'll get healthy enough that we can love him back. He doesn't need it, but he knows we need it, and he waits and he hopes. So the cross was this revelation of God in Christ that you can spit at me you can humiliate me you can put nails in my hands and my feet you can mock me and say if you're such a big wig come down from the cross and i won't i will if this is what it takes to show you that you can trust me entirely that my almighty infinite power is always under the control of my sacrificial love if that's what it takes to win the trust of you humans who i love and cherish And even though I know I'll only win a few of you, that's what I'll do. I'll go to a cross, and I won't get off that cross. I'll die. I'll I'll go into death itself if that's what it takes to show you that you have nothing to fear in my power. My power is only and always harnessed for your good. And that's what that verse is talking about. It's also affecting the angelic civilizations because they didn't know this side of God until evil was allowed, until sin was allowed, until all the destruction that's come from sin and evil was allowed. They didn't understand this part of God, that he's merciful, that he's kind, that he's gentle, that he's patient, that he's reconciling, that he's a rescuing God, a forgiving God. They couldn't see that. Joseph's brothers had no sense that they could ever be forgiven for what they did. Second Corinthians 4, it talks about some people that they, they still have no appetite for this message of God's revelation to rescue us in Christ. It says the God, notice it's a small g, it's talking about Satan. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. As a result, they don't see the light of the good news about Christ, glory. It is Christ who is God's image. It's saying that there's some people that when they see the goodness of God, the absolute sacrificial loving goodness, they just go, eh, big deal. I got other things I'm interested in, man. I got this I want to buy. I got this I want to experience. I got this I want to achieve. I, you know, I don't, I don't need this. If that, if that works for you, that's cool. I, I don't really need this. They're saying there are people like that. They, they can't see the meaning and the purpose of life. They don't know who they are. They don't know why they're here. They don't know how they got here. They don't know why the world is the way it is. They don't know where it's going. They don't know where they're going, but they're okay with that. You know people like that. You probably work with some. You might even live with some. So that's what this is saying. But God, through his revelation, rescue, wants to make himself known. And he does. Let me share couple words with you God is most completely revealed in his sacrificially loving efforts to rescue mankind God really loves mankind when I was preparing this message this week God sort of gave me this illumination that I haven't had before about his real feelings for mankind I'm going to try to I'm going to try to express it in just a minute but first let me let me ask a couple questions Here's the first one. Might we be resisting God's rescue by rejecting his rule? In other words, there's some area in life where we know what God's will is. We know what it is because we know what it says in his word. But we're saying, no way, no how. When it comes to this part of my life, I'm doing it my way. I don't care what you say. I don't care what your will is. So we're, we're resisting or we're rejecting his rescue. We're, we're depriving ourselves of the best because we don't want him to rule. You're not going to rule over my life in that area. Perhaps some of us are saying that. Joseph's brothers dreaded the thought of him ruling over them, but, but all it really turned out to be was a God-intended rescue. Might you or I be in that same situation where we're resisting God's rescue? He's trying to rescue us in some area by rejecting 
his rule. If I trust Christ, the manifest evidence will be I will be obedient to him and his word. If I'm not obedient to him and his word in every area that it speaks, I have to question what I'm calling trust. Second question. Might our distance be depriving us of experiencing the fullness of his forgiveness and affection? Let me, let me apply this one a little bit. Some of us, even though we have put our trust in Christ, we still struggle. Me, I am one as well. We struggle occasionally, if not a lot, with feelings of guilt, shame, fear, self-loathing. We know what it says about God's forgiveness, but, but somehow it just creeps its way back into us emotionally, and, and we can't seem to figure out why can't I relax in God's grace and joy and forgiveness and so forth and, and, and the scripture the passage with Joseph it gives away the secret let me show you back in Genesis again Genesis 45 Joseph said to his brothers what did he say to them come what close to me I'm your brother Joseph the one you sold into Egypt he's, he's, he's letting them know I know what you did to me do not be distressed and do not be what angry with you, yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. And he did what? He kissed all his brothers and he wept over them. Here's what God showed me. He showed me, I, you, we, we're all the brothers. The brothers are us. We feel love deprived because we don't have the union with God the Father that we were created to have as human beings it's been broken we get pieces of it so we feel love deprived and love starved and that makes us angry and that makes us envious and that makes us jealous and that makes us resistant to God's goodwill and we're we're hurting and hurtful we get hurt and we hurt one another and we resist God we, we, we don't really trust him truth be told we struggle to trust him even though he sacrificially revealed himself on a cross we say eh, you know i don't know maybe so maybe this and we deprive ourselves of the peace that god wants to give us we live with various degrees of guilt of shame and the inevitable fear and foreboding and insecurity and inferiority that comes from those things not being sufficiently resolved and, and I'm here to say what God showed me is this is that if if I'm willing to own my brokenness my fallenness my sinfulness my inexcusable sinfulness in his presence he's just waiting he wants me to lock eyes with him in that condition so that he can finally grab me weep on my neck and kiss me I want, you to, I want you to see what I saw. Think of the, the full coverage of all the guilt and all the wrongs you have ever done in your life. And God's right there face to face with you. And all those things are right there. And you have no excuse for any of them. And all he wants you to do is, is get a little closer to him. Everything in you wants to run from him because you're scared to death. You feel so guilty. You, you feel so unworthy of anything but punishment. But he's saying look at me look at me look at my eyes lock eyes when they locked eyes with Joseph they expected to see anger and hate they didn't they saw nothing but love Joseph loved them he just needed them to stand still long enough that he could actually express it we deprive ourselves of the healing grace of God when we won't get close to him in our soiled broken inexcusable condition that's what the Lord showed me and I hope maybe he's showing it to some of you the same way because because I need that I crave that I, I want that closeness I, I want the spiritual experience of my God my King my Lord my Savior I want him weeping on me and kissing me and I desperately need that I'm not going to be fully whole and fully human and fully alive until I can live in the reality of that experience and neither can you even if you think you can so will you come close as you are and accept the undeserved 
love, forgiveness, rescue of the one who wants to rule in our lives so that he can continue to rescue us and we can experience his kind of life in our own souls. Will you make yourself vulnerable to him today? Let's pray. You see our hearts, Lord, and, and you know how scared we actually tend to be of you. And, and we, we put up all kind of facades to keep you at an arm's distance. We put you into some sort of religious box. And, and we come up with all these things. But getting close to you, and we know we're so far from being like you, it, it's really scary and uncomfortable. Particularly when we're resistant to your rule in our lives. May your spirit go deep in us, liberate us, free us, rescue us this day that we can live a life with your kisses and your tears always upon us. Father, we ask these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.